the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it's closer now than it's ever been I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the call But at the midnight cry We'll be going home When Jesus steps high cloud to call his children the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that remain But at the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, and I look around me, and I see prophecies fulfilling. signs of the times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear my father he'll say son go get my children but at the midnight steps out on a cloud to call his children the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that Jesus comes again at the midnight cry when Jesus comes again. Again. Well, good morning. Let's stand together. Well, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Celestial shore, I'll fly away. Oh, sing it out today. Here we go. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. Here you go. When I 
die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away with the shadows of this life of growth. bars of I'll fly away here we go sing it out I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by Would you remain standing for a moment as Brother Charles comes to greet and pray for us? Thank you for being here today. Amen, amen, amen. Be seated just for a moment. I want to share a couple things with you. This coming week Or be ends, seated. Or whatever, right? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> uh, this coming week ends our three-month prayer initiative that we've been praying for. There's been 154 people joining us together, praying every day are three specific things that our people will begin to have a culture inviting unchurched people and guests to Sunday school and worship that our membership will recommit to regularly attending faithfully and serving in one of the ministries of our church and that God will give us wisdom and knowledge to prepare for receiving the coming population growth in our area and I know that God is already working and stirring and answering prayer about that amen so if you've been part of our prayer initiative for these last three months, I want to say thank you. We'll be talking more about uh, more specific prayers that we'll be praying together as a fellowship in the future. I especially want to thank our prayer uh, captains, uh, David and Lori Legg, Ken and Ken Stepp, and Doug and Vicki uh, Evick uh, for leading us uh, and, and their teams and keeping them informed about what's going on and uh, some of the teams even praying together after services on Sunday. It's been a beautiful thing for me. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And then I wanted to make this announcement. Uh, the unofficial count of our Christmas Eve offering is $50,500. Amen. That is, uh, that is beyond anything that we've ever received uh, in our Christmas Eve offering. And you know and I know that all goes to missions. So we celebrate that, right? And we bring our gifts to Jesus. But Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And our missions is really about going out to the least of the least, reaching them with the gospel across our, our, our community, our, our, our state, our country, and around the world. And your missions dollars are making an impact. We just praise the Lord for that. Amen. If you're a guest here today, and I know that we have some guests uh, I know some of our members are out doing other things with family and they're out of town and that sort of thing. We, we, we celebrate the fact that they're able to do that and families are able to get together. But we don't want to neglect to say thank you if you're a guest for being here today. I say it every week because it's true. Every week we pray for God to join us in our worship service. So if you're a guest, then you are an answer to our prayer. Somewhere near you, there is a, uh, a guest card. If you'd take some time to fill out information, we'd love to connect with you in these coming days in some way. However it is that you want to share your information, whether it's your uh, address, phone number, email address, whatever uh, you prefer us to contact you by, we would like to do that. Update you with uh, our calendar of events that's going on here and also uh, opportunities for ministry that you may want to be involved in. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to be standing back together, right? Let's do it. And then you can find somebody and just, just uh, say hi to them today, all right? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful uh, that we've been celebrating through this Christmas season uh, the message of Christmas uh, to the world through the angels and their message to uh, the world as they announced the coming of Christ and all the things that were related to that coming. And Lord, we thank you today for the other message uh, that says that uh, Jesus is coming again. And we're <laughs> singing about that, celebrating that today, because Lord, just as surely as you came at Christmas in the advent of Christ, you're coming again. 
physically to gather us together. We, we rejoice in that. And so, Lord, we, we, we pray for our members that are uh, out of town, visiting, having family in, unable to be here today for whatever reason, that, that you would watch over and care for them where they are. We thank you for our guests that have come. Lord, I pray that today they would feel like this is their church home today. They would feel welcome, loved, and appreciated. I pray, Lord, that all of us together would worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our church. Thank you for all those who, who uh, prayed over these last three months. Thank you for all of those who gave in our uh, Christmas Eve offering, Lord. We rejoice in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and welcome one another. Sing with me. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the dark, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy Sing it out What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah with me. Here we go. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning. That sealed the promise. Sing this. You're buried. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave is no. Then came, then came the morning. Let me hear you sing it. That sealed. You're buried out of the silence, the roaring lion declared no. Oh, Jesus, yours is the Hallelujah. 
time church here we go take a deep breath and sing it with us hallelujah praise the hallelujah death has lost us you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope God you are my living hope Amen was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be yeah sing it jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he one day they led him up calvary's mountain one day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. sins far away rising he justified freely forever come on one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day And one day the grave could conceal. And one day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord evermore. Save me, buried he carrying my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. sing these words one day the trumpet will sound for his coming and one day the skies with his glory will shine day my beloved is bringing oh beautiful savior this jesus is mine Living, he loved me, and dying, he saved me, and buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day is coming.
first verse, Mike. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be. Amen? Oh, give your father a hand. Come on, girls, y'all come sing for us. You may have a seat as we continue to worship. They're going to make their way this direction. I'll give them some music to walk by. Jesus comes again. When we we'll sing Hallelujah at the top of our lungs, we'll fall on our knees before the Father's Spirit Son. His kingdom come to earth the moment heaven returns. When we all believe and we will bow before. Just sing, oh come, let us adore Him, just like Christmas Eve in Bethlehem, that's our Christmas Eve in Bethlehem.
Well, we're still celebrating the uh, season of Christmas, Christ coming into our world, the event of Christ. We've celebrated uh, through our Christmas Eve service. I know we all celebrated that uh, yesterday during the day of Christmas itself. And uh, we, we are grateful for the Word of God that lets us know what happened on that first Christmas as Christ was born into our world. Most people do not know, however, that there are more verses in the Bible about the second coming of Christ, that is, when He's coming in the future, than about His first coming uh, in Bethlehem over uh, 2,021 years ago. The second coming of Jesus is called our blessed hope. I love that. Our blessed hope. It's called the blessed hope because when you really understand the significance of the return of Christ again, coming the second time into our world, then uh, it, it gives you comfort. Uh, it gives you strength. It gives you uh, confidence to face the future. If you have the hope of Christ's return living in your mind, living in your heart, uh, you know that no matter what else happens in this world, that one day the world will be set right. How many of you want that to happen? Our culture has lost its way. And uh, this world is uh, misguided and, and misdirected. And all kinds of uh, bad and, and uh, horrible things go on all the time in our world. Well, I know that Christ is coming. And that's our, our hope, isn't it? That He's not just coming, but when He comes, He is coming to set things right. God reigns, we, uh, we win, amen? Evil and wickedness is put down, wrong things are made right, we win, hallelujah. And that's the story, of course, of uh, Christ coming into the world. The night before Jesus died, and before He went to the cross, He said to the disciples in John chapter 14, He said, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, and after I prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. And uh, when, I, uh, when I come again, I'm going to gather you up and take you with me into heaven. That's the, that's the words of our blessed Lord to the disciples tonight before uh, his trial and all the things that happened. Uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, he said, and receive you unto myself. And here's the key, that where I am, there you will be also. That's the promise of our blessed Lord. And so, uh, in, our, uh, in our Christmas series, we've been talking about uh, the message of Christmas. And we've been talking about the message that the angels brought. I want to bring to you the final message uh, that the angels brought concerning Christ in His life here on earth. It's in Acts chapter 1, if you would like to turn there in your Bibles. Uh, beginning at verse 9, the Bible says, As Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, the disciples is there with Him. He's giving him the final instructions. He's telling them when the, uh, when you, that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And they shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then uh, he ascends into heaven. Uh, and uh, he's, the angel said, then when he spoke these words, while they, the disciples, were watching, he was taking up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, here's the angel speaking again, man of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. That's the story. That's the promise of the angels. That's part of the, the Messiah's story here on earth that he, he came. He lived a sinless and a perfect life. He gave himself. He died upon the cross, was buried in a tomb and resurrected. And now he is ascending into heaven. And as I said, John 14, verse uh, 2 and 3, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming again to receive you to myself. Now, I'm asked uh, regularly uh, by people, especially over those last few years, uh, Brother Charlie, do you really believe that Jesus Christ is going to return to earth? And my answer is yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's yes, he is. No, no question about it. But explanation points all around it. Absolutely, Christ is coming again. And so today, as I thought, we end uh, our, our series and we talk about the final message from the angels concerning Christ here on this earth. 
uh, we would compare his first coming and his second coming. And uh, I think this uh, will be a blessing to us today to think about this same Jesus is coming again. Uh, the first time Jesus came, it happened slowly. And by that I mean uh, Jesus came the first time in the world like you came into the world and like I came into the world. He was born. And pregnancies have been, are, and will be a period of nine months. Now, thankfully, I don't, I've never experienced that. But I'm sure that if you're a woman, you think it might have felt more like nine years <laughs> at times in your life in the pregnancy. But that's the fact. Uh, a pregnancy is nine months. Uh, he came as a baby because uh, that was God's plan all along. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 uh, the Bible says, the prophet says, uh, here's a sign that you're going to receive from God concerning the Messiah. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son and, and uh, shall call his name Emmanuel or God with us. And so I believe he chose that path because God wanted to identify with mankind. Uh, I've heard it said before and I like, I like how it said, he didn't come to scare us. Uh, he come to save us, right? And, and that's the coming of birth. There, is there anything more precious than, than a baby being born? Uh, we, we have uh, new babies in our church. We look at them and just ooh and ah over them because there's just something precious. There's nothing frightening about them unless you're a parent and don't sleep for about six weeks. But other than that, that uh, there, there's not anything frightening about it. You know what? It's a beautiful thing. And that was Christ coming into our world, identifying with us. Uh, he, he came to save us. And so he came into the world, like all humans come in the world, as a baby. Uh, the angel told Mary, Mary, you will become pregnant, and you will conceive a, a son. And uh, you'll bear this son, and his name will be Jesus. Mary's question, as we've been talking about through this series, of course, was, how can this be, and that I'm a virgin? I've never known a man. How can that be? And the angel answered, with God, nothing is impossible. I like that statement. Amen. With God, nothing is. Let's say it together. With God, nothing is impossible. But even though it was a miraculous birth, it was still a birth. And it still took a period of nine months for him to uh, have, after conception, to enter into this world. Now, uh, I'm making a point here. The second time he comes, it is not going to be a long time in coming. It's going to be instantly. The Bible says that uh, it will happen in a flash as fast as a twinkling of an eye. That's an interesting uh, word, twinkling of an eye. That's in the New King James uh, Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, the twinkling of an eye. I was reading uh, concerning this. One of the commentators said uh, that the twinkling of a blink a blink is about 0 0.1 second. 0 0.1 second. Uh, he said uh, scientific uh, 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 discovery or an explanation of a twinkling of an eye would be the time that it takes a light to hit the pupil of the eye and reflect from the back of the eye. You know how fast that is? According to this commentator, he said it is... Point forty seven zeros and then the one. That's pretty quick. Dr. Terry said the twinkling of an eye is the distance, uh, the time it takes when you're, uh, the light turns green for the car behind you to honk his horn. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just how I drive. I don't know if that's how you drive. It's quick. Amen. Can you say that? It's quick. It's going to happen suddenly without warning. As a matter of fact, Jesus' second coming, the Bible says, Jesus himself said, it's going to be, the Bible says, it's, it's going to be without warning. Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief in the night. Jesus gave a parable. And he said, uh, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was going to come and break in his house, he would prepare for himself to be ready for the intrusion of the thief. Likewise, he said, you must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will return when you least expect it. I don't know when he's going to come. Uh, I don't know when the return is going to be. 
Uh, there's a lot of people say, you know, I think we're living in the last days. I do believe that. I, I've said often, I, I believe the Lord is, is going to come soon. I don't know if the Lord is going to come soon, but I know that when he comes, it's going to be sudden. That's how it's going to be. Uh, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Uh, three times Jesus tells us in the New Testament, be ready, be ready, be ready. I used to have a, a pastor friend, and he would preach about the second coming of Christ. And he said, I don't know when it's going to come. He says, uh, I and you as a, as a church, uh, we were not elected on the uh, time and place committee. We were elected on the welcoming committee. Uh, I don't have anything uh, to say about the time and place. I can tell you this, that we are to be ready to welcome him uh, when we come. We were talking about, uh, with some of you this morning, about uh, the patrol and, and what that meant and Christ coming. You know, the bride did not know when that the bridegroom would have the house ready. She just had to be prepared for all that that was going to take place. Can, how many of you lady, ladies wish that that's how weddings were done? None of you <laughs> wish that. Uh, well, maybe some of you may wish that. Don't have to go through all the stuff to get ready. Uh, but when, when it is ready, Christ is going to come. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to come. He will come in the clouds, the Bible says in Revelation. He will come in the clouds and every eye will see him. Now, the first time that Jesus came, it was uh, a quiet coming. Only a few people actually was uh, uh, alerted of his birth. Uh, you know, the angel, uh, we, we sing the Christmas song, Silent Night, Holy Night. And uh, that, 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 that song just kind of sets the scene probably in Bethlehem the night that Jesus Christ was born. Uh, there there would have been uh, uh, very few people aware of it. Born, as you know, uh, we, we think about it uh, in a uh, stall of an animal. I've been to Israel many times. I've been to the site many times in Bethlehem where uh, it is believed the very birthplace of Jesus Christ. And it's not a, uh, a barn that's built. It's more like a cave. And that's, that's how uh, many of the shelters were back in those days. And there would have been a uh, few people aware of it. You, we've seen and talk about the... Uh, innkeeper had no room for them in the inn. Uh, it wouldn't have been a hard probably for the shepherds to find it. Bethlehem at that time probably didn't have a population of more than 300. Now the census was being taken by the fact that they were even there. Uh, they had to come to the birthplace of their city to be uh, counted uh, in the census. But uh, it probably would have been too hard. I mean, have you ever thought about, well, how in the world did the shepherds find Jesus? Well, they were probably connected, and they probably, hey, where is, where is a, a, a place where there's a baby born? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, go down to Sally's house and across the street from Ruth. <laughs> there's where the baby is. I wasn't there. I don't know it. I'm speculating now. But what I'm saying is, you know, a lot of people even, even recognize what was happening. Now, the shepherds certainly knew it. Other people around the scene probably knew it. But no one had any idea, really, of the significance of the event that was about to happen. It was, uh, it was a quiet night, a peaceful night, as they sing about in the song Silent Night. But can I tell you uh, that the next time that Jesus returns, the entire world will hear and see the coming of Christ. Uh, it, it's going to be a loud and a glorious time. It will be the end of history as we know it. The first time uh, that Jesus came, a single star in the sky led the wise men. I've, I'm intrigued by that, uh, that whole idea. Uh, very likely they were uh, from Persia uh, and probably students under the teaching of Daniel from uh, years and years beforehand. Daniel was brilliant and God gave him insight about the end of the world and things that were going to happen. And, and the Magi very likely were kingmakers. But out of that uh, teaching of Daniel, very likely heavily influenced. Uh, and that single star brought them to Bethlehem. A single star unnoticed by most of the world. I don't, 
I, don't, I'd, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna see that in my mind's eye. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to know what it was, that star that attracted them there, how, how it was. I was uh, watching a news which uh, was on recently, and here, here was this one bright star out there, and, and the, the uh, uh, broadcaster said, uh, that's one of the planets. I forget which planet he said it was. It's just beautiful, just a beautiful star. I don't, I don't think it was probably like that. I don't know what it was like, uh, but uh, that star was sufficient to bring the wise men all the way from Persia uh, to where Christ was. But can I tell you, when Christ comes again, the universe is going to open up and it's going to welcome the Christ. That single star then, the next time uh, the light, uh, Jesus will light up our world, amen? Jesus will light up the entire sky. Uh, the Bible says this uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, just as lightning flashes, lights up the entire sky and everyone can see it, so will it be when the Son of God returns. I want to tell you, my friend, there'll be no, uh, there'll be no uh, not knowing it. And that day, uh, it, was a, it was a sign for a few to know where the Messiah was going to be born. But when this Messiah comes again, I'm getting chicken skin just up here thinking about it. The universe is going to light up and the world is going to know. Uh, nobody really uh, uh, was affected by it then. Everybody is going to be affected. Let me say it like this. Nobody's going to miss it the second time when Christ returns. His angel, uh, he's going to be accompanied uh, by the angels in heaven, the Bible says. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 again, it says, The Lord will appear with burning fire from heaven and his powerful angels. Can you imagine the powerful angels of God coming again? He will come in the clouds, the Bible says, and everyone will see him. Now, the first time Jesus came, only a few people honored him. Think about that. Uh, the shepherds, the wise men, a few, a few uh, uh, that was in the entourage, absolutely, probably, with the, uh, the wise men. Uh, but, but people, for the most part, didn't notice. As a matter of fact, Jesus grew up like every other boy. Obviously, we, we don't know a lot about the life of, of Jesus, the life that he lived, because that's not the point of the Gospels. The point of the Gospel is not filling us in on the life that Jesus lived, but on the death that he died. That's what the Gospel is about. It's like born, fast forward, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. But John said this, the, the books of the world couldn't be written down and contain everything about the life of Jesus. It was amazing. One day, we're, we're going to have more insight into the life of Jesus Christ. We're going we're to fully more understand that. Uh, but not, not in that time. As a matter of fact, uh, his own family, uh, most people were, were, were not uh, believing that he was a Messiah, or at least not fully uh, convinced that he was his own family didn't believe that he was messiah obviously mary did joseph did it wasn't until after the resurrection that they believed and i said all the time the resurrection changed what it changed everything it changed everything for them they understood it in john chapter one the bible says he came into his own but his own people did not receive him they rejected him they beat him they made a cross for him. He laid himself on that cross. He wasn't a victim. He was a victor. They nailed him, however, to that cross and he died. But can I tell you, the next time that Jesus comes, everyone is going to honor him as Lord. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 11, as surely as I am the living God, everyone will kneel before me and everyone will confess that I am God. Everyone. That means every celebrity. That means every politician, every global leader, every businessman and businesswoman, every military personnel, every athlete, agnostic, skeptic, atheist, 
Uh, and, and I just could think of other things to add to that. Let me just say, everyone is going to kneel and say that Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of the Father. Every tongue will confess that, my friend. He will be honored when he comes again. He wasn't honored in the first coming, but he's going to be honored. Uh, at the first coming, there was no room for him in the end. At the second coming, everyone is going to make room for Jesus. He's coming in glory, accompanied with his angels. For thousands of years, God told the people of the world, many, many, many times, I'm coming. I'm going to take a body. I'm going to offer myself for the sacrifice for sin. I'm, I, I'm going to come. The Messiah is going to enter the earth. Uh, but people didn't believe it. And they said, Peter said, there, there were scoffers always. Where, where, is, uh, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, we don't, we, we've, never, we've never seen that. Uh, and people scoff at his first coming. But can I tell you, they even scoff more about his second coming. Uh, at least people around the world celebrate now the first coming. There's no, there's no denying that Jesus came into this world. He did come into this world. Uh, the Bible says that he's coming again a second time. And my friend, just as certain as uh, the Bible said that he's going to come the first time, it's, it's more certain that he's going to come a second time. Uh, just as sure as he came at Christmas uh, it split our, our uh, calendar from A.D. and B.C., which you acknowledge every time you refer to your calendar, every, day, every time that you celebrate your own birthday, the most important event in history. The Bible says just as certain as that, he is coming again the second time. And he's coming suddenly. Uh, there, will be, there will be no time to switch sides. And that's what a lot of people think. Well, when I see all this happening, uh, then I'm going to be alerted to those things and, and I'm, I'm going to change or, I, you know, I'm going to switch sides. Well, listen, uh, there's no time. How, how quick is he coming again? In a twinkling of an eye. At the hour when most people uh, disregard the fact that it's ever going to happen. Because just as certain as the world uh, didn't believe that he was coming the first time, the world is certainly not going to believe he's coming the second time. But you know what he did? And he's going to. Just exactly as the Bible said. Uh, the purpose of his first coming. The first time Jesus came was to save the world. Uh, we, you can quote this uh, by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He came because he loved mankind. He gave to the world his self so that we could have eternal life. We wouldn't perish, but have eternal life, uh, he said. Uh, it, it, it was uh, eternal life that was compromised in the garden by sinful disobedience, a desire uh, to be God in their own world, influenced heavily by a fallen angel who hated God. That's, that's the story of how it was lost. And we celebrate Christmas because, you know why? Uh, because uh, it is good news with great joy. What is the good news of Christmas? Well, we're going to have a uh, have services on Christmas Eve and take a mission offering. Is that the good news? Well, that is good news, but that's not the great news. The great news is this, that Jesus Christ was coming to make a way for what was compromised in the garden to be restored in Jesus Christ. Amen. How exciting is that? That now I have hope that my life can be changed, not just now, but throughout eternity. I can and will be different. We celebrate that. Jesus came to do what God could only do, to pay for our sin. That's why Jesus is the only way to God. He died that you might have life, that I might have life. The gift is offered to everyone. But unbelievably, people will say, no thank you to the gift. I can't imagine that. Uh, they they uh, don't want or feel they even need a Savior. But the next time that Jesus comes, it's not to save uh, the world. It's to judge the world. You know, it's interesting to me. I uh, 
talked to so many people in my life. And uh, people think, really, that they've gotten away with stuff. <laughs> How would you think we get away with stuff? <laughs> Even in, in our day, I mean, social media has pretty much got you, <laughs> right? Uh, on our phones, we have 360. We have the kids hooked up on 360. We have each other hooked they can't be anywhere. They probably can't figure out ex- exactly where they are and how long they've been there. The gig is up. <laughs> now listen. If we know that by simple social media and electronics, how much more does God, who knows everything about you, Did you know the Bible says that he knows how many breaths that you have drawn, how many hair is on your head, and how many tears that you have cried? That's just three references that very easily is found in the Bible. That God knows all of Think about that. You don't even know how many tears you've cried. You certainly don't know how many. Well, some of you are closer to that count on hair on the head than others, but. You have, no, I mean, you have no idea how many breaths that you have drawn. Did you know that God says he knows specifically all those things? My friend, none of us has gotten by with anything. We, we think just because we sin and God didn't come down from heaven with a bat and slap a silly out of us, that it got by him in some way. But there is not one thing in your life, in my life, that is not known to God. Not one thing. Now think about that. We think we've gotten away with stuff. And yet God says, I know the good, and I am glad that God knows the good. And and I need to hit that a moment. For every Christian that's done anything uh, for the kingdom uh, and, and in ministry and for God. You can't even give a cup of cold water in the name of uh, God without him knowing it, taking a record of it. He also knows that. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows the ugliness of our heart. He knows, he knows what we didn't say, but we, we said in our heart. He knows every one of those things. We haven't gotten by with anything. And yet, God is a God of love. He loves us, but he's also a God of justice. And in Acts Uh, Paul talking uh, in Athens he says God has set a day for the entire human race to be judged with justice now underline that in your mind you and I if you're a believer we're not going we're not going to be at that that judgment seat amen we're going to be at the reward seat but not not at the bema seat but not at the judgment seat But if you're standing there at the judgment seat, the Bible says that you are going to be judged with justice. Now, how many of you know that in our country, we applaud our judicial system? I do. I'm glad we have it. I think it's it's better than probably any other uh, system that's set up. But as much effort is put in in our court system to do justice, how many of you know that justice is not always served or sometimes the court gets it wrong. Uh, It's it's not uncommon. More and more we're we're hearing about uh, people that have been convicted and and literally served years of their life for crimes that that they found out now has been proven that they didn't even do. Uh, as as, As good as we try in our world, but listen to me. When God judges, he's going to be perfect in his judgment. There's not going to be any mistakes. Not any appeal that ever come back. uh, Because he never gets it wrong. He always gets it right. And he's fair. And you know why why that we have a judicial system in our country? Because uh, we're made in the image of God. And we have have an uh, uh, inward knowledge of right and wrong. It's, It's put in our minds. And in our hearts, we, we just know it. But I'm telling you, we long for justice to be done. God says, I am going to right all the wrongs. 
in the arrogance of some people who feel like that they, they're never going to get caught. I've got news for you, my friend. God is going to get judged fairly and completely with justice in the world. The first time Jesus came, he came to die for our sin. That's how much God loved us. Uh, I'm, I'm often asked, and I was asked just a few weeks ago, again, by an individual. How can a loving God send people to hell? Have you ever been asked that question? Let me give you the biblical answer to that question. He didn't. He came into this world to die in our place so nobody nobody would ever have to go to hell. He gave the Father his only begotten Son that he could live in this world and be the sacrifice for our sin so that nobody ever has to face the justice of God. He bore it. He bore the justice of God. It was upon him. And we never have to look back. Amen. That that Jesus, when, when, when he died on the cross, made available for me to stand before God in his righteousness. Not in my righteousness. But in his righteousness. I'm in Christ. He is in me. Listen to me. How wonderful is that? That I avoid what justly I deserve. Because he he bore that on, on himself. For me, Jesus came into this world for that very reason. And so the next time he comes, uh, he's coming to take his family home with him. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus will send his angels, the Bible says, all around this earth. And they will gather up the chosen of God uh, from every part of the earth. Everyone is a creation of God. Everyone is loved by God. But the Bible says only those who have come to him in faith. And giving their heart to him. The Bible says, the moment you do that, Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, the moment you ask Christ to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit seals us. You know what that means? It means your name can never be removed from the Lamb Book of Life. I'll just give you my my humble but accurate opinion. You know what I think the most horrible thing about the great white throne judgment is going to be? The removal of people's names from the Book of Life. Can you imagine? But because the Holy Spirit has sealed us, I'm going to be with God in heaven. Hallelujah. That, gets, that should get us excited. Amen. Uh, that's the reason that Jesus came into this world. The family of God is called in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church of the living God. Even in our country, the country I think that more than any other country in the history of the world, has embraced the teachings of the Word of God and tried to fulfill it more than any other country that I I can ever imagine in history, in our culture, is beginning to more and more hate the church. The church in this country has never been through persecution. Uh, We're having more and more of that happening, not physical persecution As we've talked about before. But there's all kinds of persecution. And it's becoming stronger and stronger. How wrong they are. Uh, The world needs God's church. And God's church needs to go into the world. Because you know what? Only the church is going to be taken to heaven. Only church. I want to close by reading a passage of scripture. Philippians chapter 2. 5 through 16. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, born just like you were, born just like I was. Being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's why he came. He came to offer himself up as a sacrifice for sin. Now, because of that, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Isn't that interesting? There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. 
Have you ever heard anybody ever curse by saying, Oh, Buddha. (laughs) My Confucius. Do you know why that is and, and never is going to be? Because Jesus is the name that is above every name. And you know why Jesus is the name that is above every name? Because he's God. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name, there is no greater name, of Jesus. Every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Therefore, because that's true, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now so much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disrupting. And disputing. And some of us maybe need to work on that a little bit. I'll raise my hand. That you become blameless and harmless as children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in this world. Holding fast the word of life. So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. It's easy for us to celebrate that Jesus is Jesus and one day every knee is going to bow. And some of us are kind of looking forward to some of the people that are going to bow. (laughs) It's wrong, I know. I'm just being honest. In my carnal flesh, sometimes I think, wait, pal. Your day's coming. You're going to fall on your face and declare Jesus to be Lord. But that's not all that we said there, right? He said, now, that's God's part. We have a part. There's something that ought to be changed about our life because he is who he said he was. We are to be who he called us to be. Amen. I love our beautiful church family. Do you love our beautiful church family? But I tell you, God has called us to much more than we've been about. And starting next week, I'm going to challenge us to go to a place where we've never been before. And to be the light that God called us to be to reflect his life in this world. I don't know why, but ever since I've been in this series on on Christmas... I've been asking God, God, birth in me something of Jesus in this coming year. I'm praying, birth in our church something of Jesus that we've never been for this coming year. To let us be that light. Did you, do you like what, it, what he said? Uh, be without false in this crooked, perverse generation among whom you shine as lights. In this world. And I just want to pray over us today. So I'm going to have you to stand with me. If God has spoken to you in this message. Certainly uh, Dr. Terry, myself, Kevin is here. Others that can speak to you about a decision that you need to be made. But as I, I was thinking about this service. I figured it would probably be us. Here today. We're glad for our guests that joined us. Praise God for you. You're an answer to prayer. But we've been praying for three months about things about our church. We're going to keep praying, but we believe God is already stirring new things. Amen. Bringing forth new things. And I want to pray over us today that beginning next week, I'll be able to share some things. That I just know that God has called us to something more. 
to be brighter lights than we've ever been. Amen. As a church in the community, as the children of God in our homes. I want to be that in my home. Do you want to be that? I want to be a brighter light. I want to be a brighter light at the church. I want us to be a brighter light in our world. And, and I, this morning I hear the largest offer ever given. I think that's already God. That's God. Couldn't orchestrate that. That's God. It's a, it's a, it's a miracle. Father, as I pray over our beautiful church family, as I do, I endeavor to do every month, every family. I would pray today, Lord, as we finish out this year and move into this new year. God, that we would shine ever brighter because of you are who you are. You did what you said you would do. You're coming again, Father. I pray that we would be ready. I pray that I would be ready. Remind me every day of the need to be ready, to be ready, to be ready for that day you're coming. Lord, I pray that you would anoint and fall upon us and that you would bless us in Jesus' name. As we stand together, Michael, could you just do a stanza of my favorite song? A stanza of my favorite song, just yes, a verse. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd rather have Jesus than silver gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather. Jesus, the house is her land. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin. And I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords me today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You can applaud that. It's beautiful. That's a song that means a lot to me, Michael. Thank you for singing it. As we close today, let me close with a blessing from the Old Testament that I believe God would have us speak upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And I never read that. I don't think of one of our deacons challenged. Brother Charlie, listen. In Psalms 3, the Bible says that God is a lifter of our head. I pray God would lift your head. Amen. And you would see him as he is. And receive him as he is. God. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you and give you peace.